everyone, and welcome to another episode of ASAP, your African social activism playbook. I am your host, T. Jamal, joined as always by my sister, Michelle. What's going on, sis? Hey, brother. I'm doing pretty good. Um, had a pretty productive day so far, so I'm feeling good. Everything's going well. Um, feeling nice and healthy. I'm glad, you know, everyone is doing good. How about you? How are you feeling today, this morning? It's a day. <laughs> it just, I, I woke up this morning. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not elated for any reason. I'm happy to be doing the show, of course. Happy to be on this side of the earth. But it's just one of those days that you have to get through. <laughs> I know I got work today. I got uh, some long hours, but it's cool. We still making it, still surviving out here. Right. And so, yeah, it's going to be a fun show, though. We got some good information. And so much just happened that kind of happened throughout this week overnight that I kind of want us to cover. And then yeah. uh, try to draw that into, you know, the people that we're talking about today. So it should be a, a, a very entertaining show. So yeah. I wanted to start off <laughs> with <laughs> our um, with our straight truth, no chaser. So um, people have been getting on Killer Mike, right? Because there were photos mm -hmm. that came out from, I think, Governor Kemp is the person who released photos. It was like his photo op. So there were photos released of Killer Mike with Governor Brian Kemp. I couldn't remember his first name for like two seconds. Right. Governor <laughs> Brian Kemp of Georgia, who <laughs> is known for um, suppressing the black vote during the election. Uh, doing a lot of questionable, borderline illegal activity, you know, during that campaign. It was questionable how the Secretary of State um, can run for office while they are in the position of ensuring that the polls and voting and all those things are, you know, they're responsible for that. So they can, right. they have control over it. So there's a conflict of interest. So that is our history with Brian Kemp. He is now the governor of Georgia and many people, myself included, feel like that he shouldn't be. Right. Um, but he has the position. So if we want something as a community, we can't just say Stacey Abrams is my governor and I'm going to go right. up to her to try to get actual institutional things changed because she's not in that seat. Right. Right. So exactly. whether you like the person or not, whether you respect the person or not, whether you voted for the person or not, if they are in that seat of authority and you need something from or you are demanding something from that that place or that institution, then you have to go talk to those people. So, right. but there was backlash because Killer Mike sat down, had a meeting with Brian Kemp, and there were immediate comparisons to Kanye meeting with Trump. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there, and then I'll let you go. And and what do you think? Because I'll I'll come back to that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely I saw that. Um, I don't know who I saw it from uh, first. Maybe someone came up with, you know, a statement or something about it. And that's how I saw the the picture. But I already know, you know, knowing Killer Mike and knowing mm -hmm. that he's a knowing that he's really for his community and he's a strategist, right? He's about solutions. He's not just talking about it. he understands this concept like you just said, um, no matter who's in office, we still have work to do. We if we have an agenda, you have things that you want to accomplish, you still have to move on, right? You can't just be sour and um, you know, sad about your person, the person you wanted uh, not being in that seat. And so I already knew when I saw that it was Killer Mike, I'm like, you know, well, great. Like he's, 
getting to it, right? He's not going to sit there and, and just be mad that Stacey Abrams is not in the seat. He's still going to meet with him. And, um, you know, I'm sure he's he's coming up with, with something, you know, trying to negotiate some type of deals or whatever uh, for the community, for our community. And um, actually, I saw on his Instagram, you know, I follow him on Instagram and I see, you know, different things that he's always into. He's a businessman. You know, he's a, um, he's about community uh, organizing and and all that good stuff. So I saw that he had gotten some accomplished that um, that he had been working on, which I wonder if it's a you know, if it's as a result of this meeting with Kemp with um, he was saying that he got like a trade program, like a GED and a trade uh, program approved or something like that. Right. For for people in the community, for young people. Um, I think it was like ages 16 to 24 or something, you know, so he's establishing, you know, like actual like beneficial things uh, for the community. So I already, you know, I didn't have a doubt about the person, um, you know, who, uh, who we were dealing with. And here's the thing. So he did release some things. I'm not sure if it was on Twitter or Instagram, but I do follow Killer Mike on both platforms. So, you know, sometimes you get your messages mixed up of where you saw things. Um, right. But he's saying that, you know, some of the key points of their discussion was uh, building up more, you know, counseling programs for youth, for black youth or mm -hmm. urban youth instead of uh, sending them, you know, to jail. Right. Counseling over jailing. Right. And then also discussing creating more opportunities or just giving more opportunities to black owned businesses for government contracts. So I was listening to some people talk about those things and they were they were they were kind of limiting or kind of poo pooing how significant those things are like understanding that us having economic access is a key for our self-sufficiency. Right. We tell them, give us access to this that you have authority over. We do for ourselves and then we're not, it's not a handout. We still right. have to do the work in the government contract and then that money comes back to our community. Now, what we do right. with the money when it's in our community is up to us. That's on us. Plus, another mm -hmm. thing about Killer Mike is that why he's not Kanye, not only does, because Kanye was at one point seen as a conscious rapper, but we mm -hmm. knew way before, long before he ever sat down with Trump that he had kind of swayed away from that, that mentality. So that's that's the first thing. Killer Mike has not shown any shift in his messaging. He does things in an unconventional way, like meeting with NRA. But if people don't know, Marcus Garvey sat down with the whatever the leader of the KKK is. Mm -hmm. Like we out some of our greatest leaders have put themselves in a room with people that they know they don't like right it doesn't matter about like it matters about production productivity right. progression are we going to get something done right what is my agenda and how can i get you whether we shake hands or hug after the meeting is irrelevant Right. Are we going to get some tangible things done where we can actually produce something that's going to move forward for the next generation or even just this generation? Are we going to get something? Are we demanding right. something? We have an agenda. And so those things are important to note. My uh, my second point is. On the. Killer Mike was already doing things in the community. He's already buying back the block. He mm -hmm. and um, T.I. are, I think they bought Bankhead Seafood. So they're revamping that. 
and they they already have it up like a, a um what do you call those things pop ups. So Bankhead Seafood is only open every now and then, and it pops up in different places, and right. uh, it just helps to get the name out there. So that's cool guerrilla marketing. And then you have them buying individual, you know, lots of land along Hollywood Road, along um, Donald Hollowell, along, you know, Simpson Road. So they're just buying up blocks and doing it bit by bit and encouraging people who have the means to do so in the black community to do the same and follow along with them. The same right. idea that we have with African Unity Initiative, our bringing the neighbor back to the hood campaign is about us doing the work first. Do what we can do with our resources. Then when we meet with the politician or we meet with the elected official or the person who has the title of authority, we are not coming to them with a handout saying, okay, I have nothing that I've done, but I want you to give me this. No, I'm right. going with all of this success and saying, these are the things that I've done with the resources that I have in my own community. I will leverage with you and allow you to put your name on this or get a photo op with us if you bring more resources and help us sustain what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. With Kid or Mike already having these programs that he is doing with the means to do it and the, the social capital to get a meeting with the governor, he's utilizing that plus what he's already doing to say, all right, this is what I was able to do on my level as, you know, a local rapper. Right. Yes, I have some money, but I don't have political clout like someone who is in office. And I myself am not going to run for office. I want to be the puppeteer and make them do what I need them to do, regardless right. of party. That's what we so should be doing, here, right? And these are my agenda. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I mean, and the, and the backlash comparing it to Kanye is ridiculous because Kanye sat there and, you know, nearly called Donald Trump his daddy. Like, he really embarrassed us. So, you can't well, just I look at feel, things on the I, surface. I we talk I, about I have, nuance. Mm -hmm. I have um, a lot of nuance. We talk about nuance. And different. just because you see a picture. Go Finish ahead. Point, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish your point. And then I'll speak. Now, I was it's just saying, bag, just because you, know? you see a picture that that's similar, like you see a picture with Kanye and Trump and Kanye's wearing a Make America Great Again hat. And then you see a picture of Killer Mike in whatever you call the governor's version of the Oval Office. Um, mm -hmm. It's not the same thing. But you go ahead. You were saying something about Kanye. Right. Yeah, I mean, I have um, a little different view of Kanye. I don't. I'm not gonna say specifically on the like on the meeting with Trump. I don't care for his relationship. You know how he he speaks to Trump as his friend, and you know and things like that. Um, but I don't. I think you know a lot of people have a, a problem with Kanye and and think that his intentions are horrible and I don't think his his intentions are bad. I don't like the way that he, you know, that he does or speaks about something some certain things uh sometimes, but I don't I never question his intentions. You know, I don't think that he just switched up and he's, you know, a lot of people say he's just a black capitalist. Just like, you know, people said with uh Jay Z. They think the same thing about Jay Z since making a deal with um you know, with the NFL, well, joining with the uh, NFL. NFL, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. see them as being, you know, like have turned their back um, on the community. I think other people, like we talk about, you know, how our activism can look different and like the way that we go about things can just mm -hmm. look a, a whole lot different than other people. And I'm like, I know Kanye is, he's very intelligent and he's an innovator, right? Like he's, 
if you pay attention to what he's doing, like with his um, what he's doing with his own money, right? Like a lot of people talk about he's being bought by the Republicans or Trump, you know, and they're paying him to be a distraction. First of all, Kanye, you ain't never heard nobody be able to like silence Kanye or like get him to say something he doesn't want to say. He is very bold and outspoken about these things. But when you um, and then at the at the end of the day, he's his net worth is even more than Donald Trump. So, you know, I don't know. I think that's out. But um, I think like when you look at what Kanye is doing, he is um, like he's building like on his own land. He bought land to build um, like his, he's doing like a seed to sow thing. I think he said with his brand, like growing the actual crops to make the fabric to, you know what I mean? To dyeing it, to sewing it, like all of that stuff. Right. And his intentions are also to bring jobs to, you know, to the people like he, his intentions are not bad. I don't think, you know, I think he goes about things in a way that just seems very irrational, you know, to, to, uh, to other people. But I don't, I still wouldn't even give him like, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I wouldn't throw him away. I don't, um, I don't think so. But yeah, for, for someone like, Kevin I don't Mike, know. Though, I understand. Mm -hmm. I don't know about throwing him away. I wouldn't throw Kanye away. I just think he's very misguided. And I think the expectation of him from his former rhetoric to some of his rhetoric in the last, I would say, two to three years, like he's running. He ran for president late. Right. He decided oh, I'm going to run for president in 2020. And then he holds this rally where he says that. You know, Harriet Tubman didn't free any enslaved people. Then he says things like enslavement was a choice because it lasted for so long, kind of, you know, feeding into an idea that we did not resist, which is what something that on this show that we have, you know, done a good job of combating the idea that we did not resist. Like thinking that, think you know, that, I think so that just there comes, are things that's going to come to your interpretation of of what was said, because I got something totally different than what he said. I didn't take it as he was saying that, like our mm. ancestors chose to be enslaved. He was saying 400 years, which we know, you know, for the 400 year mark just passed. We have been free before mm -hmm. then, like, you know, almost 200 years before then. So he wasn't saying that our ancestors chose to be he was. What he was actually talking about when you think about the context he was saying that what we the things that we choose to be enslaved to now he was talking about like with uh social media and um you know the just the distractions and and uh fashion and all of these you know celebrity all of the different things that we choose to be enslaved to now he was talking about like we were enslaved all the way then but now it's it tends to be it seems to be like you know it's voluntary like something that we are choosing uh, to do because we talk about all the time. We're not all the way free, so part of it, of course, was not was against our will. Mm -hmm. But I think you know I wouldn't. Uh, that's why I'm I'm very careful about like just trying to assign my own ideas or like or interpretations of what someone said. I I would think that I would um mm -hmm. you know would would give someone a little bit you know give them the benefit of the doubt. But um you know of course we wanted to hear what people say, you can't just um, assign your own um, beliefs and stuff, you know, or, or whatever, you right. know, uh, what someone else said. My but thing I is, at I didn't the beginning, at if it's, and, and that's, and that's interesting, like people walk away from things with, you know, different interpretations, true enough. But I'm just saying there becomes a pattern of, of things that look you know question mark is one thing and then a pattern of question marks looks a little shady in the light so you have to start and, and i'm not saying that i wouldn't have a sit down with with kanye and try to understand what he's you know what he's talking about or what he's on and yet he does things differently but i think that right now we are in a position where we have to have a, a message and not saying that everybody is going to regurgitate and say the exact same thing, but we need to have an agenda that is solid, that everybody is on these same talking points. And like we said, you can be a Du Bois or a Garvey or a 
Booker T or a Malcolm or a Martin or Ella Baker or a, you know, Sojourner Truth. You can have your own path, but we have to make sure that your, your destination, your agenda is the same. Right. We have to make sure that it's leading down the same path and not skewing us because, you know, people can overanalyze what Candace Owens says and and bring validity out of some of her points. And, you no. know, we can we can <laughs> do mean, this. And then the, right. but the thing but is, the reason clear, we even know who Candace Owens versus, is, is well, because I mean, well, that's Kanye. The, yeah, well, that's the thing is that like someone like Candace. Owens, she has her idea, you know, and and other people like her, you know, with the same talking points as her. I wouldn't say that there is the same as mm. Kanye West. Like even when he, you know, I'm not gonna sit up here and just be the Kanye West defender, but I'm, you know, at the same time, I don't. I will speak about like what I don't, what I didn't um, interpret. Um, you know that you know the same message that other people have. Um, you know, because that's the majority tend to feel this way about him or about what he said, but. I'll be honest about what my interpretation mm -hmm. of it was, right? And I'm not intention. I'm not trying to like, you know, just sift mm -hmm. through all the bad to find the good. But understanding who Kanye is, also like from the very beginning, being yeah. a fan um, of his, like I understand that he he mm -hmm. is even running up on the stage with the Taylor Swift. He's a guy that he's gonna say something to catch your attention. He's gonna, you know what I mean? And I don't think he did it in a disrespectful way, but the way that what he meant, what he's trying to get to, like he doesn't finish explaining maybe he's not that good with putting it into words like to really conveying the message that he meant to get across but he knows that it's going to be controversial which at the end of the day mm -hmm. will still get people's attention he understands like the culture of social um you know the like the social um social media and like the the value that yeah. you social that you media. have yeah. because social yeah and like the the currency right the social mm -hmm. currency as well because he knows that he's in the in the public eye he knows that he'll get a lot of attention and so people at least you know how a lot of people will be like well like any publicity is good publicity right like people will start to talk about it i think that maybe yes. even though he doesn't i feel like it's not a like a bad intention on his part like to to say things that's gonna offend people, but he says it like, of course he knows mm -hmm. he's gonna shock people. Like bringing up Rosa, I'm uh, bringing up, um, yeah, Rose, I'm not Rosa Parks. Oh my goodness, Harry Tubman, Harry. Um, and who is my favorite, like my all time favorite ancestor, right? Like she is my my favorite, um, and I wasn't offended. You know what I mean? Like I was like you shouldn't have said her name you know like if you weren't gonna bring if you weren't really gonna drive that point of like under and really and you know having people understand what you meant by you right. shouldn't have said her name or you that, know what i mean like so uh -oh. in that case in that case i think you know like he should not have um you know brought her name up but at the same time like defending the point that was supposed to be made was it was freedom from one mm -hmm. situation, but at the end of the day, we didn't have, you know, it wasn't total freedom. Like the things that we need to be doing now, the things that we should be focusing on now, which we talk about is things that are actually liberate us and not put us in a position to mm -hmm. have to uh, depend on other people, which back in that time, they didn't have the choice. Right. Like, so that's the thing that he didn't, he didn't mention. He should have included Right, but and did not. You know, problem. he failed to include that part. But at the same time, there's a I mean, lack it's of like, nuance okay, well, you, we can talk about what someone points. should have done. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, but with anything, with anyone, we could talk about what they should have done, could have done, or you know, shouldn't have said or should have said. But at the end of the day, we do have voices of our own. We can influence these people. Like we talk about counseling them. Maybe it's a different way. Mm -hmm. Maybe trying to teach people how to talk about certain things you want to bring up this bold point then counsel them on the right way to say it or you know what i mean the right way to use these examples i think he just he's not good at finishing the point and we talk you know, about yeah and that's and that's the problem so i'm not on the cancel culture you know we always talk about council council culture over right. cancel culture Canceling right. people doesn't really make any sense to me because where do we put them? Is there a room right. that we all the canceled people in that they like they can't come out of? 
What are, what are we doing with them once we cancel them? Where do we want them to go? So I do believe in counseling people, but I've seen people reach out to Kanye and try to counsel and he's not listening. So that is also a point where, and I know he's, you know, diagnosed as bipolar and all those things. So maybe just shut up sometimes, but that is, <laughs> I just, I just want consistency. And if you know, you have a tendency to rile people up. Yeah. Then maybe it should be another messenger and people have to be held accountable and we have to hold our people accountable for saying irresponsible things because not everybody, like there are people who are still going to be in influenced by things that he says and then take it on the surface level. Everybody's not going to dig a level deeper and say, oh, Harriet Tubman, he's not saying that she didn't free anybody. But if you look at the time period, right, we cannot look at the past with today's goggles and then they, they didn't do enough because that is not, that's not fair. It's disrespectful and it disregards the the atrocities we talked over and over again about just this show right here and the freedom to do it without looking over shoulders that in itself is a gain right where we're talking 100 200 years ago nothing like this would exist without the the constant threat of okay i'm literally risking my life to do it so to say something on a platform like his as ir is as irresponsible as she didn't free anybody. She just put them to work with other people, not understanding the the complexity of the situation of chattel enslavement, right? And freeing people from that and risking her life going back and forth. I just think that kind of that lack of nuance in that conversation and, and then not even explaining himself deeper is irresponsible and shouldn't be said. And the person has to be held accountable. Yes, we're going to counsel them. And I don't think that the words that I'm saying right now are counsel words. They're counsel words that somebody who's listening to them can learn from and say, OK, I should do better. This is what I should not do. But then I'm also saying this is what you should do. You should respect. You should understand new ones. You should have a complete thought. Maybe you write down your ideas if you know that going off the top of your head, you're going to go from subject to subject. But back to Kevin Mike, I just think it's so different from that meeting that Kanye had with Trump that people are comparing it to. And people are so quick to throw out the word coon without looking yeah. at nuance. What tangible operations are going to come from this? What is the person already doing in the community and how is this going to level up what they're able to do? Like we said in previous episodes, it is very necessary to be aware, to be conscious of what's going on, but not conscious to the point that you not that you question everything. We should question everything, but we don't accept anything. There are certain things like. Even if you are on the reparations train, right? If you're on the reparations train, you're accepting something from the government. If you want your stimulus check, you're accepting something from people that you don't necessarily trust. We right. are in the position we have to. So we're going to get something from them. We may as well demand that it be our agenda and not theirs. And that's, right. and that's my point. So exactly, you know, we could go forever on on that topic, and we have another um, interesting topic that we're gonna cover at the end of the show. But we're gonna jump into our highlight reel because I appreciate this woman. Yeah, um, somebody who, funny enough, knew David Walker. And they cross paths a lot because she was her speaking career began around 1831 to about 1833. And she was, you know, doing work from to the late like 1840s. But, um, 
Yeah, they had a lot of the same messages. Now, people say that David Walker was a little more, you know, combative mm -hmm. in his tone and his rhetoric. And Mariah Stewart was more maybe compassionate, <laughs> but she right. still was fired. So right. Maria Stewart was, again, again, one of my favorite things to say, born free abolitionists. Yeah. I love those people because, again, they didn't have to be. That means they risk their own freedom because somebody could have easily said, y'all need to shut up and just be happy that y'all got any position at all, that y'all not right. in that situation. So ignore them, turn blinders to the rest of the black people and, and try to, you know, just keep it moving, which some free black people did. Exactly. So for those <laughs> who were born free and still became abolitionists, I give them all the credit in the world because that is that is the, the heart and soul of a champion. That is a champion defined so well. And, you know, she became a public speaker, like I said, around the 1830s. And we're going to go over one of her. Well, it, it, it's like her second to last address and she got into some hot water over it and we'll go over it in a minute. But go ahead and, uh, and play the video and we'll okay. learn a little bit more about Maria Stewart. Maria Stewart was born Maria Miller in the year 1803 in Hartford, Connecticut. Although she was born free, little was known about her parents as she was orphaned at the age of five. At that time, she was taken in as an indentured servant by a white family where she would remain there for the next 10 years. During this time, she used the family's library and taught herself to read. After separating from the family to support herself, she worked as a domestic servant and also began to further her education by attending Sabbath school. She then moved to Boston, Massachusetts. In 1826, at the age of 23, she married James W. Stewart, a war veteran and a shipfitter, and she became a part of Boston's black middle class. Three years later, her husband died, leaving her a web widow, and due to unfair business practices, her husband's estate was swindled away from her. During this time, she got involved with black social institutions she herself believed that she was a warrior for God, freedom, and for the cause of oppressed Africa. The abolitionist movement also started at this time. William Lloyd Garrison has just established his abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. Garrison urged Black women to contribute writing to his paper, and Maria Stewart quickly responded. She gave Garrison several writings and essays to publish in which he did. The first of these were entitled Religion and the Pure Principle of Morality, the Sure Foundation on Which We Must Build. After the essay was released, she began delivering public lectures. She later became the first woman in America to give a public address to mixed audiences. She gave a total of four public lectures in which she spoke about accountability, unity, self-determination, and economics within the Black community. She also advocated for women's rights and called for Blacks to resist oppression. However, by 1833, she backed away from public lecturing. She then moved from Boston to New York, and she continued political activism and teaching. In 1835, Garrison published another one of her works, Production of Mrs. Maria W. Stewart, which was a collection of speeches in essay form. Stewart became extremely influential after the work was published and women all across the country began lecturing openly. By 1852, she had moved to Baltimore, Maryland and began teaching privately as she struggled through financial hardships. In the following decade, she was appointed head matron at the Freedmen's Hospital and Asylum in Washington, D.C., the hospital to have been established by the Freedmen's Bureau in order to service Black patients. She also continued to teach while working at the hospital. In 1878, at the age of 75, a federal law was passed granting pension to widows of veterans of the war in 1812. 
she began receiving $8 a month and used it to republish one of her works, Meditations from the Pens of Mrs. Maria W. Stewart. The book was published in 1879. Maria Stewart was an author, educator, and human rights activist. She was also the first American woman to lecture publicly to a mixed audience, and her legacy lives on today. If you enjoy watching our videos and would like Yeah. So, Miss Mariah, Miss uh, Mariah Stewart, like we like to say, um, a true champion. Oh. Are you, I think you're on mute, bro. Mute it again. So, like <laughs> I was saying, Jatun Bailey was familiar with uh, <laughs> Ross Stewart. So, I, I know how her name is spelled, right? So, it's spelled Maria. But the way I learned about her, they call her Mariah Stewart. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's spelled like Maria. I heard Mariah. So, we're going to say Mariah because that's how our professor taught us. <laughs> But, but I believe I thought uh, it was shout Mariah. out to Jatun Bailey for yeah. uh, being familiar with Mariah Stewart. Yeah, everywhere mm -hmm. it's written at without the H, so it's written yeah. as Maria, okay. right? But okay. I've always heard Mariah from everybody who was, you know, a professor or who taught me about her. So I'm gonna go with Mariah, and then you know the ancestor will come tap me on the shoulder and say. Okay. <laughs> so we'll wait for that time. <laughs> but the the important part is her legacy is, you know, so dope and important. And one of my favorite things about this whole, you know, this whole era is that when you when you listen to the people from this era uh speak, they they refer to black people as the sons of Africa the sons and daughters of Africa, like Africa is so prevalent in their rhetoric of this time period. It's so necessary for us to know this because we right. get so caught up into what, how we define blackness today as black Americans, as, you know, us born Africans, we, yeah. we kind of forget that even in the immediacy, like during enslavement and the immediacy after enslavement, a lot of our institutions and of our organizations were named in honor of Africa. They had Africa in the title. We knew where we came from. We had knowledge right. of what we had done, which is very impressive. Like we talked about yesterday with David Walker, like the information mm -hmm. that he knew about the pre-colonial Africa and right. Mariah Stewart also you know, shows that same level of knowledge, that level of awareness of who but, we are, of where we yeah, came so, from, and, right. and our connection to our roots. Right. So listen to how she how they explain um, you know, being an indentured service uh servant to the family, to the white family, and she had access to their um library, right? And I'm sure that they had a lot of information. So she taught herself to read. Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of them had to do, you know, back in that time or, you know, were taught to read. And so they had information. They had access to some information um that obviously, you know, the the black people who were not um freed at the time, you know, they had more access uh, to information than they did. And so I think, you know, with when we think about like the the mm -hmm. literature and you know, all of the different things that uh, people, when we don't, when we're not only thinking about black history, you think about like the free people, right? Who <laughs> were right. walk, walking around and the arts and the, the different uh, conversations and things that they were having. If they had these these books and articles and all this stuff, um, you know, then obviously the people, you know, who the black people who were free and were able to read um, and had access to this information, you know, they would be reading that same uh, materials, you know, if they could get their hands on it. But yeah, I, th I think that's fascinating. I too. also think that um, we, I think we underestimate our, our capacity for maintaining oral histories 
And so yeah. even, you know, Africa, there are many civilizations that did have reading and writing, right? And there right. are many more that pass down tradition orally. And the, you know, family members were responsible for it, but there were also societies that had specific people who had the capacity to remember a lot of information who they were the oral historian and they kept mm -hmm. the records of things right. that happened. And, you know, the accuracy of that information was impeccable. And, and so underestimating that those oral historians didn't exist during the time of enslavement and how much information did not get whipped away and traumatized out of us during that time period. We, we right. consistently talk about our, our resistance, the fact that we resisted and resistance is not always a physical thing. You can resist in not forgetting who you are. You can resist in maintaining certain elements of your culture and you can see those things in some of the things that we still do today that we kind of attribute to just American blackness. That if you right. look a little deeper, that it traces back. And a lot of that has to do with our ancestors resisting. And so some of that could have been, been oral history as well as, you know, having access to libraries and such. So I just, you know, I thought about that when we were, you know, thinking about David Walker. And then when I was marveling at, you know, Mariah Stewart's knowledge and the way she spoke and she was, like I said, they say that she was not as boisterous as a David Walker, but mm -hmm. she wasn't playing any games though. And, you know, in her readings and in her writing, she demanded a lot. Like when they say accountability, she wanted us to to really be responsible for our own actions and she really right. talked a lot to freed black people saying that you need to use your your freedom your ability to move around to help a lot of us to help all of us and we should have been doing this the entire time and she right. was challenging a lot of people, men, women. Like they said in the video, she was the first woman, not first black woman. She was the first woman mm -hmm. in American history to address a room full of, you know, white and black people, men and women. Right. So, the you know, lecture, she was woman lecture in America. She, and. She spoke up not only about our rights as black people, but rights of women. Mm -hmm. And she's like one of the and there were so many people like I was looking her up. Right. Just on Google. And I didn't realize how many people had been influenced by her. Um, like I saw. Who did I, I see? I saw um, why her name. The 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 poet who did uh Ain't I a Woman? Yeah, um who am I thinking <laughs> now about? that you said it, why is my why Maya is my Angelou. Brain since Maya Angel? I was about to say Maya Angelou. It <laughs> came up as soon as you said it. So you see, yeah, you see my Angelou um talking and reflecting about Mariah Stewart and so many other notable names that I saw when I was, you know, just Googling her because I have her. In the same book that I was reading from yesterday, Classical Black Nationalism, go mm -hmm. read it, Classical Black Nationalism. But they have her entire speech, her address at the African Masonic Lodge. Again, African was in the name of institutions that we started right. during enslavement. Mm -hmm. During the time of enslavement, when black people had been freed, there were free black people roaming around, the same time enslavement was happening, we started our own institutions and a lot of our first churches, a lot of our, you know, Masonic halls, a lot of our anything had either freedmen or African in it. And right. so I wanted to read some some quote from the this address just to to bring home some of the points of, of what she was talking about. One of the things that stood out to me, she says, 
It is of no use for us to wait any longer for a generation of well-educated men to arise. We have slumbered and slept too long already. The day is far spent. The night of death approaches and you have sound sense and good judgment sufficient to begin with. If you feel disposed to make a right use of it, let every man of color throughout the United States who possesses the spirit and principles of a man sign a petition to Congress to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia and grant the rights and privileges of coming free citizens. And she goes on to say some other things, but she is talking to to men. This is like, get up and do something. Exactly. Right. Use your freedom that you have and speak on behalf of all the other people who can't speak for themselves. Do it now. We don't have time to wait for the perfect situation. We don't have time to wait for everybody to get the perfect level of education. She right. said, and you're good that, enough isn't now. That the thing? You have enough. Yeah, is it, isn't mm-hmm. that the situation that we're facing now? Like, um, you know, a lot of us, even like how we've spoken about several times on this show alone, about the, look at how many millionaires mm-hmm. and billionaires we have amongst us. Look at how many innovators, how many educators and educated, right? And we are still facing a lot of the same exact problems, like literally holding up the same picket signs, literally the same laws and everything, Mm -hmm. you know, um, on the books, we're still in the same situation, but it takes, I think that's the, but that's the trick. That's the, I think that's the main trick is this illusion of freedom that we um, have gotten accustomed to in America and and probably, you know, in a lot of, um, different areas too where we're still being uh colonized at least you know um you can mm-hmm. say that for the same you know black people all over from the uk to you know in the caribbean and wherever where there are still oppressors that's that's running you know that's calling the shots even in blackface right <laughs> um but i think it's a, mm-hmm. it's an illusion of freedom um that we have thinking that well since i can I, since i have access to this now since I can move about freely, you know, then, you know, all of the, all of the black people have to do is it's like we take on that idea of like, pull every man should just pull himself up by the bootstrap. And it's like, well, we didn't have boots, right? The boot, the boots were stolen. And then, you know, it, and I think we have to get out of this idea because a lot of people now still have this idea, even when we're talking about, um, you know, black people making money and, and starting businesses and and investing in all of this stuff, right? A lot of black people still believe that all we need to do is just get money. All we gotta do is have money. No, that's not all we have to do, right? Because money didn't buy us freedom. You know, there were black people, and that's the thing I think a lot of us don't actually realize was that during the time of enslavement, there were still black people walking around, black people that had, you know, that had businesses and, you know, and, and free, as they want to be, but still were not involving themselves like people, like the ones we're highlighting now, mm-hmm. black abolitionists who were born free, some of them who had uh, gotten their freedom, like maybe bought their own freedom or, uh, you know, something like that and have still gone back to make right. sure that other black people were free. You know, like, and that's the thing about being a champion. You, it's not just about your mm-hmm. personal situation. We all, we have to think about all of us. We are not getting anywhere right. by being, in the, you know, with this uh, individualistic mindset. We have to think as a group. Mm-hmm. And the thing, like, to go off that point, like, we are celebrating, and, and I get a big smile on my face when I see a born free abolitionist, not mm-hmm. just because, you know, of that situation, not to not to take anything away from somebody who was you know, enslaved and became an abolitionist, not to take anything away from them, but they, they know the experience. And so it, there's a tinge of, there's a tinge of, you know, personal connection to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, the experience and you go back. So there is, you know, you're a champion as well. When you go back, like Harriet was definitely a champion because she mm-hmm. still risked her life to go back. Right. But to be born free and to know that there's a position of 
of privilege there where you could possibly ignore the situation because you haven't been through it Mm -hmm. to connect yourself to something to connect yourself on the basis of your people speaks volumes about the type of person that you are meaning whether you were enslaved or not you would have still gone down that same path that's Mm -hmm. dope right so you know and and those things have to be acknowledged and i just want to read one more thing from this address and it's the last the sentence but it's dope so the last sentence that she says is african rights and liberty is a subject that ought to fire the breast of every free man of color in these united states and excite in his bosom a lively deep, decided, and heartfelt interest. I just, African rights and liberation. Not black, not, you know, African-American didn't exist at the time, not Negro, not colored, not any name that they gave us. African, Mm -hmm. taking it back to who we are at our root. And it was Mm -hmm. just, it came off. It was just in her rhetoric. She didn't make a quotation of it. She didn't have to redefine it. It was just how they spoke, which I putting so much emphasis on this is because there's so many people um, throughout the African diaspora that buy into this separation. Right. African unity, African diasporic unity is real is a sentiment that has existed in us from the time that the diaspora has been created. So when we talk about Pan-Africanism, it is not a new idea. It is not something that is unattainable. It is something that we have desired on the shores of the US, on the shores of South America, on the shores of the Caribbean islands, Spanish speaking or French speaking or Spanish speaking, African people have shown an affinity to Africa. It is after years and years of miseducation. It I would venture to say it wasn't until we were being educated by them that we were led into their schools that we Mm -hmm. were let into their universities, that we started to move away from the African rhetoric. Exactly. But the self-educated David Walker, the self-educated Martin Delaney, the self-educated Mariah Stewart, Paul Cuffey, all had Africa on the mind. So African unity is real. It's attainable. Mm -hmm. It will continue to exist. It's something it's that we necessary. are fighting for, and <laughs> just mm-hmm. and and I just you know this our Monday morning quarterback the address at the African Masonic Lodge. The fact that the you know what I mean. So it wasn't just her because she didn't start the hall. So there were already people who had the same mindset that she was speaking to, right? right. Which means that this era, like why, and of course, this is a rhetorical question. We know the answer of why don't we hear more about the individuals from this era? Again, this is 1833. Emancipation isn't till what, 1865? So this is, this is 30 something odd years before emancipation, right? before Juneteenth. These are people speaking about Africa during enslavement, right. fighting against the institution. And they're talking about Africa. And in the immediacy after the institution of slavery, you, you hear individuals talking and lauding about Africa. So the idea that Black Americans didn't have an affinity for Africa is a false narrative that has been given to us. It's been given to our brothers and sisters on the continent to believe that we didn't desire to be back. 
it's been giving mm -hmm. to us over here that we didn't, you know, we moved away and we it, it's told to us that during enslavement, all of our history, all of our knowledge and all of our culture was stripped away from us. And what we are learning, the more we learn about those time periods and not just as some block in U.S. history where we learn about the Revolutionary War, and then we skip 50 years and then we go directly to the Civil War. We skip right. what, what I'm talking about. We skip 150 years and skip right to the Civil War. That's how they teach us U.S. history in elementary right. school. Exactly. Go from war to war to war. For some reason, the American history is fascinated with violence. Everything mm -hmm. is everything we learn is around a war. Every right. bit of history but, is around a war. And if there wasn't a significant any, any bit war of conflict, happening time period, it's as if nothing happened. Yeah. Any bit of conflict, though, you know, for the people who are being oppressed, though, violence seems just, you know, just too radical. Why, you know, be peaceful. <laughs> you don't accomplish anything with violence. Why are you so violent? You know, and it's like our reaction is going to be violent because we are <laughs> we're feeling the violence. Right. And I, that's the whole contradictory thing about, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, our dealings with America. And I, I don't I don't personally waste my time even giving that much thought, like, you know, listening to the responses of, of what people have to say about how we react. I just, you know, again, very thinking about solutions and like we have to think as a group. So I'm not thinking only, you know, what I have to do or what, what I think, but also understand, I think it's very important to under for all of us, or at least most of us, right? We talk about this critical mass, at least most of us to understand how deep it is, like as far as the knowledge that we are being fed. We talked about how the American school system, period, was not meant to educate all of us, right? We had to fight anybody. to be educated, right? It wasn't anybody. Meant to educate anybody. But but white men, right? Well, not educate exactly. It wasn't meant to educate them. Not even them. It was it was meant right, to indoctrinate meant to them. them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But when we think about that though, just the this the whole um that whole institution, why would you we we talk about and I think I feel like we complain a lot about what we weren't taught, how we weren't taught this and that about ourselves in American mm -hmm. public school system, but not Still, at the, at, we're this far along. We talked about how in the 1830s, they're talking about this stuff, right? They're talking about us as Africans and what we need to do, our personal responsibility and all of this stuff. We are still here today talking about how, like, as, with Black, as many Black scholars and, you know, all these people, we have, we are still complaining about what we weren't taught and how we weren't taught. Of course, if you are thinking on, um, like uh, as you're, if just put your put yourself in your oppressor's boots, right? Why would you give the people who you want to keep oppressed? Why would you give them the key to free themselves? We know that, like you know, it, it's been plenty of, of uh, research done, like on those schools and the type of schooling that that infuses like the culture with the learning, right? Where kids get the to experience, um. You know, they they get their culture infused with their learning, and so they feel better about it. They get better test results, better, you know, all this stuff. Why would they be purposely putting this stuff in our education? Of course they're not. Of course we're meant to just stay, you know, indoctrinated. Of course, it's, you know, if, if they have a, a system worked out to where it's funneling, funneling us from schools to prisons. You know, like, of course, that information is not going to be on there, be in there. So why? At this point, have we not, like, I'm talking about like a majority of us, right, created the system to, like our own system to educate our, our people? Because we, sh we should know, like, especially when it comes to identity, learning about our identity, that divides us so much. Now we are in a position where so many African people don't want to call themselves African. Everything that we've been taught by our oppressors about Africa and about Africans has been negative. We have to take it upon ourselves to educate ourselves positively about Africa. And that, that whole thing we talked about before, I think our first week we talked about this whole idea with, um, you know, um, Afrofuturism and like reimagining Africa, like what Beyonce did with Black is King and what we see 
uh, with, with Wakanda and, um, and Black Panther. We do need to start coming up with more um, creative ways, like any type of way to get ourselves thinking more positively about Africa, right? We can settle all of that other stuff later, like go visit, all right? When we get to the position to where we at least want to go visit, want to know Africa, want to connect with other Africans, then we can settle all that, you know, what's real, what's not real, you know, is it, do they wear jeans? Do they, of course, right? We can get right. to all that. But <laughs> in the meantime, we need to be innovative enough like to and understand the importance. We want to leave history out of it. History exists for a reason. They indoctrinate us with their history, with American history, with European history all the time for a certain reason. So we need to learn our own history and teach our mm -hmm. own history. But sorry, I'll, I'll off spoke that about point that. where you talk about <laughs> No, nah, no, nah. you were cooking, so I let you cook. But the thing is, off off your point of us needing that imagery, right? Why are so many people interested in medieval times? Because not only do they have the actual factual historical um, media about it, you have how many King Arthur stories do we have? We got cartoon King Arthur stories. Mm -hmm. We have magical, um, fantastical, you know, stories of King Arthur. We have the real life gritty versions of King Arthur. Like you put King Arthur film in Google and about 30 movies will show up. Right. Right. Now put Mansa Musa in and how many films are going to show up? Right. Hmm? Put Sunni Ali in. How many films are going to show up? Shaka Zulu, you might have what one, maybe two films or show up, a mini series in the movie, maybe a couple mm -hmm. of movies. And that's only because they try to paint him as some warlord. Right. Towards the end. And it's like, look, we need fantasy. We and, and, and then even beyond that, you have people fascinated with what? Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. Mm -hmm with right. game of thrones all of it fiction but still has it shares the aesthetic of europe during the medieval right. times so and they can think, connect with it oh man i feel that dungeons and dragons all mm -hmm. of that shares that aesthetic that's games that's fantasy mm -hmm. that's sci-fi right. We need the same thing for Africa. Exactly. There's nothing exactly. wrong with that. It's going to get more people interested. You're going to exactly. see a time period reflected. When we talk about time travel, and we'll have like a whole week just talking about time travel. Because when I hear people talking about time travel, black people, they're like, there's no time in history that me as a black person would want to go to. That's because you don't have a full breadth of understanding yeah. about history. We talked about this a couple of days ago where I said history was happening in more than one geographical location at a time. Exactly. Exactly. We don't think of it like that because when we're painted with history, we're usually only talking about one geographical location. When we talk mm -hmm. about ancient Greece in that time period, whatever time period that was, uh, BC, right? We talk only about that geographical location during those years. We don't go anywhere else. Like nothing else right. in the world was happening at the right. same what time. What were they doing in Ethiopia over there at happening. that time? <laughs> right. Right. Insane. Right. Like no, no. Socrates, Aristotle, all got educated in Kemet somewhere, but they don't talk about that. They never go to that geography. They never go mm -hmm. to that place. They go to them going back to Greece. That's all they talk about. And so it's so interesting that so we need the media. We need the sci fi. We need the imagination elements. because That's what's going to bring the next generation in. That's what's going to keep the adults in. If I grew up watching, I'm so connected to Lord of the Rings. I not only want to know about Lord of the Rings. I want to know about the time that they were referencing. If I grew right. up loving Game of Thrones, I'm going to watch Game of Thrones. I'm going to listen to the author. The author is going to say, I pulled this from some reality 
reality elements and some fantastical elements. I'm going to want right. to dig deeper into the reality elements and what parts exactly. of history was he referencing. If we did the same thing for Africa and made it a fantasy and made movies and TV shows and games and all these things where people are, you know, geeking out about us, our geographical mm -hmm. locations, our our mystical, magical um, realms, because we have we have the the Odisha. We have right. just as many of of those types of things that we can build upon. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we engage in that way, then we would know a lot more. We would be willing right. to read more. Exactly. We will read the fantastical, maybe be introduced in that way, and then come back to reality. It's yeah. not a one See, thing at, or the at, other. Right. Look at how, how uh, like some, um, yeah, some some artists, some celebrities are have been including some things. Like I think was it a uh, David Banner? Did he do something with Orishas? I think it was David Banner. Um, but I I know that he. I think I think mm. he started to. Um, you know, like just point out certain some things, and then like Beyonce, a lot of people know about Oshun because, um, you know, because of mm -hmm, Beyonce, exactly. you know, in the songs, and and that's the thing is like we have to just be putting dropping little subtle hints at the very least, right? We have to get yes. ourselves knowing mm -hmm. knowing how the culture moves now, knowing how people, knowing how our people, we are of the world now, right? We are in the world, we're of the world. We get caught up in things like, you know, in fads and and all the all the the hype around a lot of different things and entertainment and fashion and everything. We have to think about innovative ways to include important facts in history and all kind of stuff like that, because we we do want understanding that. We need to start from our children. Right. A lot of us adults, like some of yep. us can learn still and be inspired and and you know, switch around our behavior or whatever. Um, but I think that we should focus definitely on our children when we talk about education, right? Because they can soak up a lot more information. They don't have to fight off. They don't have to unlearn and then relearn something, right? We can start right. by teaching them things, programming them early. And if we just drop these little subtle hints, this all this, you know, little information, if we do the jobs as adults now with learning and, and knowing better, then we can start in you know, um, creating these things and influencing our children to, you know, to follow all, all of these, um, all of the new things that we can create, right? We can set it up for them. And so that's the thing. It's like, even though I think a lot of us also have this mindset, like, well, I didn't have that growing up. And I think it, it relates to a lot of different things. We didn't have that right. growing up. And so it's like, a, we want to hoard, a lot of us want to hoard information, hoard knowledge, or like, just straight up selfish because we didn't know something or we didn't have something, right? And it's like, it's not helping us at all. I think there are a lot of us though who have the creative ability. Um, I do see some things, like I tend to look at the at stuff beyond, um, you know, just the main, everything that's mainstream. Um, and so I, you know, I listen to a lot of under, mm -hmm. underground artists mm -hmm. and, and see what a lot of us, uh, Right. small like local right. artists are doing um and there are people who have these great ideas but again like we spoke about um a few weeks ago we need the people who don't have the money and the resources and the platforms we need to get the people with the money we have so many millionaires and billionaires and entertainers people with you know with a, a large following we need people to get behind this so how do we set up that's that's what i'm trying to figure out right now is how do we set up um Mm -hmm. Like a way, like some type of channel or something like to get the people who need the money and, you know, like our, our local artists are, you know, our inf inspirational, influential people to get to the people with the resources, with the money, because that's a whole nother focus. Some of us are good at making money and you can be the money person. That's the thing when it comes mm -hmm. to us taking our own role right. um, in right. the struggle is you can be the money person. If you if you're the business person, if you can if you know how to start a business and run a business, that can be your role in this struggle. But understand that you're a part of this struggle. Look for artists. Look for those people who don't have the access to the same resources that you have. Right? Like that is a way that you can uh you can be active in this whole struggle but we i think first and foremost 
we have to realize that there is a struggle, that we are all participating in a struggle and not waiting to be free. We're not waiting for someone to give us something, right? We don't complain. We you talk know, we about need- killing eating with him. We're not waiting for them to come to us. We go with what we need. We we need um, the NWA model. Easy E mm. couldn't rap. He had no interest in rapping. He had money. Right. right. Dr. Dre was a exactly. DJ. Yellow was a DJ. Ice Cube could write. Good enough mm-hmm. for everybody. Yeah. Know your story, and he could write in perfect. your voice until right. you were capable enough to probably write your own rhymes. But Q mm-hmm. carried the writing load, right? right? And Perfect. then ran some example. writing, and then mm-hmm. Easy took the money and 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 made it happen, right? So yep. yeah, and like Jatoon Bailey said, people are doing this. People are doing, and it's taking time. The thing is, we have to support the the things that are happening, right? That's what <laughs> you I just was saying. Be aware exactly. of it and be, you know, exactly. And so I think that consolidating things and, and like really being intentional about creating the hashtags and supporting them on social media. Like there mm-hmm. is, what is it called? Black Sands. I follow them on Instagram and they do like this yeah. comic strip about Kimmit, about some superheroes mm-hmm. from Kimmit. And right. it's dope. I love reading right. it. I think Rhapsody is one of the voices on it. And mm-hmm. like they're, they're slowly moving along and they're always um, like pushing new things and um, doing contests for some of their followers to, you know, even be voices on the show. Right. They right. are out there promoting exactly what we're talking about. Exactly. We just got to support it. And we all That's need to share saying. all of it's- our different platforms to, to rise them up. Exactly. That's exactly what I was saying, though, is that like, look beyond what's, you know, a lot of us just only pay attention to mainstream what's in the mainstream of course the people who don't want us to know certain things that don't want certain positive um you know um images and things shown they're not gonna be the ones to back it up right like the we can't look at we have a lot of screenwriters and you know all these all of this stuff um all of these talented people within the black community but we don't get the acknowledgement we don't get the money you know to back us to create these things to put it out on you know to the world and to us and so we need, that's why I was saying is creating mm-hmm. some type of channel, having it, making it a priority for us. We can drive, we drive the culture. It's all of us, right? Like we, if some, any kind of little trend or whatever is set, we, the people are pushing it. If we, we like, I think, to mystify this whole power. We are the people who are driving it. If we don't like something, mm-hmm. we will shut it down. If we like something, it would be popular. Everybody all over the world would be copying it. We, the people, are doing it. So if we have it in our minds to like prioritize certain things, then we could definitely see these things um, accomplished. And that's why I was saying, pay attention to like local artists, pay attention to the people who are doing the right things, who are creating a lot of useful uh, things for us. And let's figure out a way, that's my next mission, like I said, is figuring out a way to get the people mm-hmm. with the resources mm-hmm. Getting them to those people, right? <laughs> I have a project. Can we fund this, right? And then other people right. uh, supporting right. it, because all we need is is our favorite person, our favorite celebrities, our favorite whoever. Um, you know, just bigging it up, and then next thing you know, it'll blow up. We see it all the time. And and they will do it. We like you said, we we see it all the time. They they will go out of their way to use their platform to promote something that they believe in. A lot of it has to do with just getting it to their attention. Mm -hmm. Um, Social media has created an avenue for that. But even with that, so in the past, it was more difficult to reach out to a person. But if you reached out to them, it was probably less of a distraction. Right. It was it was a, a less amount of people getting their attention because it was that much more difficult now that is easy it's still kind of like it weeds out to to be the same situation because now you have direct access but they have they don't see it so right. it's about getting to them and most of the times it's about knowing somebody who's in their circle because the person themselves rarely handles their own social media they 
you rarely check their DMs, but if you have an in, then you can get, you know, but the thing is, is about having an in with the intention of helping other people and not just lifting up yourself. Right. And that's what we have right now. Right. That's what we're promoting. That's what we're doing. We want to put people on, you know, right. it's not just about us. I want this channel to blow up so that we can put more people on. Exactly. Exactly. I like, you know, I, I like the I like the Master P approach where he never held any of his people back. If they wanted to leave no limit. Right. He was like, if okay. you want to go, you he tore up the contract. He didn't want to work with you mm-hmm. if you didn't want to work with him. If you yeah. are, he was never the type of um person was like, I have to be the biggest rapper on my label. He was there mm-hmm. to build you up. Like he did not, he honestly did not care if people said that you were a better rapper or a more popular rapper or whatever than he was because he wanted everybody right. to make money. Everybody can eat. Right. right? That's yeah. my favorite line from Paid in Full. Everybody yeah. can eat. And people with that mentality can really build up sustainable communities. Like that's yeah. the mentality that we have to have. Everybody I, I think- can eat. Me yeah. being successful doesn't take away from your success. Right. I think also like something also that I've been, um, you know, trying to implement um, in my own, you know, in my personal business and, and things that I'm doing is is also working with other people. You can collaborate with people who are doing something, the same things or similar things as you. I, we always want to, I think a, a big problem also, because I, I hear some people who you know, they'll go to, to someone with a big platform or have a big reach and or they have the money, but a lot of people don't want to do it because it wasn't their idea and they want to, you know, start from scratch. They want to be the ones to to have their name all on something, you know, the only person who came up with this idea. I think that mm-hmm. we waste a lot of time like that if we think again, thinking back yep. as a community, thinking back as a whole group and understanding the importance of doing it for our people, not just as an individual, and wanting all the glory for ourselves, I think we can get a lot further. A lot of us can get a lot uh, further because we have, like, I'm not the only person who who makes, you know, uh, apparel and, you know, or, or does creative things. I'm not the only person who does it. So I'm joining with other people who do or other people, you know, like just who, who want to be involved in something that I'm doing. And like, let's figure out how we can do it together because there are things that I am not able to do easily. There's some things, some qualities that other people have that's like, well, if we come together, we could be a powerhouse, right? Like if, mm. if we think more like that, right. and I think it's, that right. goes back to the, but it, it has to go back to like thinking as a community, thinking back as a group and is what I have worthy of getting out to the people? Do, what is the importance of my product, of my message, of whatever it is that I'm doing? Why do we see, why is it necessary for our people to see? Right. And I think if we think like that, then we can get a lot further. Yep. And uh, I'm glad you said that because like I'm on here. Right. And at the end of every show, we talk about Mishmash World and we say Mishy the Maker. (laughs) Right. And we put your website up and I implore people to support MishmashWorld.com and and buy your things. (laughs) My wife is a fashion designer. Right. She makes clothes. And Don't you're my too. sister. That's my wife. I'm going to support both businesses. And right. it would be a dope collaboration. Like, it's not a competition. Mm-hmm. Everybody right. can eat. There's room for everybody. Nobody says, oh, Gucci over Prada over all, all those other high label Louis Vuitton. You see people right. wearing Gucci. You see people wearing Louis Vuitton. You see people wearing Prada, and they all are at New York Fashion Week together. Right, exactly. Like, right. <laughs> Look at the deal. Look at like what you know happened what I mean? recently, like with Kanye. What what Kanye was. Um, we we just spoke about Kanye earlier, but like him and his ideas mm-hmm. and other people. Other, you know, he always. I know about a lot of the other designers like that worked for uh, Louis Vuitton or. Uh, Gucci and all this stuff because I heard him speaking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but look at how these big brands, they are using other people. They are collaborating with other people. Even like the Louis Vuitton and right. Supreme deal. Like it's like Supreme yeah. Louis Vuitton. And th- like they are, this is how you mm-hmm. make moves. So if we want to even be like just like Virgil. 
Right, exactly. It's the same. Exactly, that's the same. Like thing, Virgil, it, he, he's like the creative mind behind one of those big brands, and it's he Louis still Vuitton, has Off White. Um, and then you got mm -hmm. probably Louis V. And then, but then you have the Off White Nikes. You got the uh -huh, Off White. So exactly. he has Off White as his mm -hmm. company, and then he partners up with the Europeans, take some of their money, invest it right back into his company, mm -hmm. and it goes like that. And I can't wait and for that. And uh, Gucci, Mish who Mosh I love. World. Right. Okay. Speaking I can't it, let's wait speak for it the World, <laughs> Yama Elegance uh, <laughs> collaboration, the uh, right. the limited edition designs that you got to get right mm -hmm. now before they sell out. You know right. what I mean? So it's going to be us doing these things at a, at a certain mm -hmm. point. But we have to have the mindset that it's not a competition. Exactly. There is space available for everyone. And, you know, when you so important. honestly, when you widen the market, it makes more people want to come to that market. Right. If you only have one brand of rice, they're going to like, man, I don't really like rice. But OK, if, if one rice company becomes successful, that means that all the rice companies are going to go up. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's just works. that simple. So yeah. we we have to we have to shift our mindset when it comes to to that aspect of things and yeah. i wanted to um to close Luca, the same. show with oh definitely so for our for the culture and so i wanted to talk about this this thing that came to my attention really this morning i saw some little elements of it ticking around last night but i didn't have time to look into it but chris rock has come out with some statements saying, or I think he wrote an article, or maybe it was a a written interview. Okay. But he was he he has come out to say that the Democrats are responsible. He's blaming the Democrats for the spread of coronavirus because here's his here's his logic behind that. He's saying that okay. yeah, you can blame Donald Trump, but Donald Trump's ignorance is that of a five-year-old and, you know, putting him in the position of a leader was, you know, a mistake from the first, in the first place. And then right. believing that he could handle this situation was also a mistake on the part right. of the people. But he goes after the Democrats specifically because they went after impeachment while letting the, while letting him fumble the ball on the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I just think this is interesting. It's interesting to go after the Democrats. Um, because he says he says the Republicans they flat out lie, and the Democrats they withhold information. And both of them uh, release, right. you know, untruths. <laughs> so right. one is a you know a lie <laughs> of omission. One is just a flat Boy, out exactly. lie, right? And so right. either way, you're still lying. It's interesting because I don't truth. I don't trust either party. Yeah, I'm already tore. Like I vote, but I vote based off my interests. And mm -hmm. then, you know, I don't hold my constituency to the vote. Again, my constituency is going beyond the vote. It's having my agenda, having a group of people and making sure that that agenda is met by whoever is in office with whatever color, right. with whatever party, with whatever mm -hmm. symbol, whatever animal, elephant or donkey, like <laughs> right. doesn't matter. Let's get things done. Let's be productive. Exactly. Let's be, you know, progressive. So mm -hmm. it's just interesting, though, because like Donald Trump is the president. The Democrats aren't in political power in either, mm -hmm. you know, in the Senate. So I'm not sure, like, even even if they distracted for a couple of months during, you know, with the impeachment process, I don't think impeachment took away from the pandemic, though, because mm -hmm. impeachment was primarily last year the pandemic mm -hmm. started around December in China and then started to, you know, we started to know that it was spreading around the world around February. Right. Mm -hmm. And then really took things seriously around March. So I don't, I think the impeachment and all of those things were over before the end of last year, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Now that you mentioned like, it, I don't, I don't even, quite remember. Yeah, because I don't remember hearing anybody talk about impeachment in 2020 because it was over. We lost. 
And I don't think that going after impeachment was a wrong thing. They should have done it earlier and they should have been more vocal about it. I don't know what they were waiting around for. So I do right. have challenges to the Democratic Party and their philosophy and their just a full approach to this, this whole thing. But to to blame them for the pandemic is just is questionable because they are not in power. Like it's I, I, yeah, I mean I feel they could speak Christmas out he, against they could have been more I think I think they could have been more vocal about what the president wasn't doing. Yeah. But I don't know how you blame them for a president's immaturity or inaction. Well, I think, um, cause I was hearing him, I was hearing some of his points on it. He was basically like, like even with the case of the, um, of impeachments, like you knew it wasn't even gonna, they knew that everybody knew that the impeachment was not going to actually, you know, we were not going to see that through. At, but, the, at um, the point that they did it and the way that they did it all, you know, they kind of tiptoed yeah. around it. Yeah, right. And so um, even with this whole thing, uh, I don't know who this person is, this, this person that's releasing all of these different um, uh, clips of, of Trump speaking about certain things and like all, how all of this information gotten out mm -hmm. that he knew about the dangers of, the, um, of coronavirus how and all this the stuff, pandemic, right? yeah. Right. And so um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's like, what was your motivation for waiting that long? to say something about that, right? right? Like, do you really care about the people? Why would you wait that long uh, to disclose that information? It's like, it seems like it's a motive to like kind of, I, I think it is politically driven. You know, when you think about it, um, think about the time. And I think this year, especially being an election year, they are, they definitely want to get the other, um, the other party, you know, in the seat. And like you said, I don't care which party, it's the same bird. I don't care which wing, you know, <laughs> that, which wing we focusing on, it's the same bird. And like you said, you know, like my personal uh, mission or my agenda, you know, would be like, we're voting for our interests, like whatever party. I, I like I said before, I was willing to, you know, vote as an independent. I, you know what I mean? Like, let's create our own party if we need to. I don't like, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not loyal to either of those parties. And I think that's something that we get caught up in so mm -hmm. much. We, a lot of us do. And I think it's because that's all we people. know. Right, that's all we know though, is that, and that's why the Democratic Party is, which is why I can kind of see why Chris Rock or anybody would attack uh, the uh, Democratic Party is because we kind of, we get used to thinking of them as the black party or the people that are, you know, the nicer people, the ones who care about the people. And that's just not true. For doing nothing. Yeah, exactly. It's the same people. You got to think about it. it's the same bird. Right. And even when you think about the um, mm -hmm. the in the Civil War, it wasn't that the people that were in the union were pro black people. <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> right. They didn't care. You know, they didn't want uh slavery to end because they wanted black people to be free. So we've always been alone. It's always been us, mm -hmm. right? So don't get so caught up in, in the party system. Um, but I, I definitely see why he would bring attention to um, the faults of the Democratic Party. I don't know, blaming him, um, like you said, for the spread of the coronavirus. But I think just like you just mentioned before, and that, that he mentioned in that interview, I believe, is... Um, you know, some is by like lying or not telling the truth is by omission of facts or by just tell out, telling mm -hmm. out uh, flat out lies, which Trump does. And, you know, the Republican Party, they right. do tell a lot of lies and, you know, they're they are good at deceiving mm -hmm. people. But I think, um, you know, the Democratic Party, we need to see them for who they are. And I think that's for us to focus on what we have to do and not relying on them to do the job for us. Cause we like to, I think we put our trust in them and thinking that they'll do right by us. And that's not the case. We always have to go about, you know, things in our, um, on our own. But I don't know, that's, I don't know. That's yep. the situation. 
Yeah, it's just interesting. I wanted to make sure that we brought it up because it was a topic of discussion that I heard a lot of people talking about, a lot of people weighed in on. And, you yeah. know, just people are, you know, have different thoughts about it. And my favorite speech from Malcolm X is the Ballad of the Bullet, where he tells yeah. you Ooh, I love right that on speech. that it, they, they're all... They all go to the same country club, Democrat and Republican. And they, mm -hmm, exactly. One of them just smiles in your face and stabs you in the back. And the other one, you know, is trying to stab you in the chest. And right. like I keep saying, I'm from the South. I like the person coming directly at me, trying to stab me in the chest because I see them coming and I can dodge mm -hmm. a stab to the chest, a stab to the back. I don't see. Right. So, right. you know what I mean? So and we, that, we've been just speaking about how mentality. we like to know who don't like us. Like what one thing that I can appreciate from this Trump presidency is the fact that it's exposing a lot of people who a lot of us thought were on our sides or didn't know. You can have neighbors, co-workers, all kind of people you grew up with trusting your children around like, you know, and they have these views of you and these ideas and so i'm glad for people to be seeing like expose them i and i already know shoot i already know i can it's like a it's a it's another because sense trump, that i have and i'm not trying to keep people around who don't like me as much credit as we want to give trump trump did not create these people he uncovered them he gave them the the empowerment to come from under the rock right i want to know that they're there <laughs> exactly right it makes right. our unity that much more you know it makes it easier to convince black people to say hey right this is what we need to do come on over exactly. stop arguing Not about cool. nonsense we have work to do yeah like we spent so Not much time in like the 80s the 90s in the early 2000s trying to convince black people that there was still something to fight for boy 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 like <laughs> 80s 90s and the i think they call it the decade the aughts now 80s 90s and aughts there were conscious people there were people trying to bring attention to things and then there were other black people who wanted to ignore those things because it felt better because it was more comfortable. Right. Because they were able to participate in some of the distractions that we weren't able to participate in earlier in the earlier decades where we were more solid. So they were like, I want to indulge in ignorance for a minute. Yeah. Let me just yep. go have fun. And like we say on this show, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You don't have to be oh so serious to be All right. Woke. Right. Exactly. You, can, be, you exactly. can still have fun. Like you can still mm -hmm. smile, right? You don't have yep. to wear a black beret and a leather jacket every day. You don't have to be right. sitting in 120 degree leather with your beret, your sunglasses, and okay. your leather jacket <laughs> and a, a black turtleneck, like right. melting. Okay, you know you're gonna mean? be hot. Okay. That is not the only hot. way, <laughs> right? That's not that's not the only way to be woke. You know what I mean? That's why we do ASAP. Like it's a playbook of plays from people who had various strategies, various implementations, various methodologies, various ideologies. They all were consistent in the fact that they led to the progression and the advancement of black people, but mm -hmm. they weren't all, you know, the same path. And so, right. okay, that oh, oh so serious path may not be built for you, but even the oh so serious people, trust me, they had fun. There were parties, like people dated, people made families, like you can have a complete life not Balance. telling you to give up your humanity is activist yeah. or human. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Balance. Balance. Yeah. That's the point. That's how we get. That's, our, so that's how we hashtag. burn ourselves out. We got our. We got a new hashtag: the uh, Freedom Fighter Smile. Right. We got a. Um, well, yeah. I already. I didn't post it one, but Freedom yeah, Fighter yeah. Smile. Right. Because balance is so important. It's good. It's going to be good for us. You know, all over, all across the board. Is you know 
we need to show our humanity in it. And I think that's where we get lost. Um, and I think like even Garvey is one of my favorite people, but it, I was listening to an interview with his son and he was like, he don't think he ever saw his father smile, right? And that's one, you know, cause I could, I could understand at that time though, you know, with him. But like you yeah. said, you, you enjoyed um, seeing that picture. It really brought you joy seeing the picture of, um, of Martin Luther King playing pool, right? And being silly with his friends. Like we need balance. Mm -hmm. We need joy. That's what's gonna keep us going. And we do, like we we definitely, <laughs> we, get the, we get the dances and the songs and everything, you know, that keeps us nice and happy, but also not getting mm -hmm. so lost in the fun that we, you know, drop the responsibility. We gotta have both, balance. <laughs> right, exactly, balance. <laughs> So, I mean, mm -hmm. just to just to reiterate and, and make sure that people understand. So Mariah Stewart, right? Mm -hmm. Address at the African Masonic Lodge. Just keep that in mind that in 1830s, in the 1700s, in the yeah. early 1900s, our ancestors, our people, Black Americans, Black people in the Caribbean, Black people from all over the diaspora, we're always talking mm -hmm. about Africa. Right. It was in our rhetoric. It just rolled off of our tongues. We named our schools, our churches, our meeting organizations in 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 name of Africa. We we called ourselves the sons and daughters of Africa. We knew where we came from. We still know it is a part of us. African unity is real, right? So when we talk about these things, it is not only one way to do African unity. Mm -hmm. But we focus on the tangible. We focus on taking the theoretical and putting it into practice. So, you know, Michelle, just let them know how they can support you, where they can find you and, mm -hmm. you know, tell them to support As, your black business. Yeah. Just tell well, them I you. appreciate that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, y'all, you know, <laughs> you heard what he said. <laughs> no, but um, you can follow my um my uh business Instagram on um at Mishy uh Mishmash World and you could also find my website at mishmashworld.com. And I added some new products. Um I'm doing like I'm into uh like headwear and stuff now. So I just released some cool little uh bucket hats and caps and stuff like that. Um and little bags and everything that I'm gonna be uh releasing. Too, but I have a lot of different things, you know, for the whole family, men, women, and children. Um, and then you can find me also to get in touch with me personally on my uh, regular Instagram and Twitter, Mishy the Maker. Dope, dope. As always, speaking of headwear, my wife, I've been trying to encourage her because she, you know, she's proficient at doing like the head wraps of the African yeah. fabric, the scarves. And I yeah. want her to do YouTube tutorials and build up her channel and build up a base on that because I know she can build off of that and just talking to right. people while she's doing a rap tutorial and then they get you know invested in her and get invested in Yama Elegance and then you know it starts going from there. Guerrilla marketing we gotta right. market any way okay. we Okay come way on sis because I can learn um, some new ways you know I find my ways to do it but yeah I love some hair yeah, wraps. Yeah see I we need, we need to encourage each other you mm -hmm. you doing this with me may encourage her and you talking to her and y'all doing the y'all collaboration may encourage her to you know to jump out because she's already in business she's not right. you know nervous to to talk about herself and her business and promote it it's just youtube is a new avenue but i know that it could when you get subscribers and supporters they will support mm -hmm. the things that you do outside of the content that you create so yeah. that that's just dope so if you guys want to get in touch with African Unity Initiative, you want to know more about our idea of unity across the African diaspora, visit us at AfricanUnity.us. Get involved. We are launching a membership program, um, $30 a month for adults. It will be $15 or $20 a month for seniors and $15 a month for the youth. And so it's going to be, it will encompass things in your community that we will get involved in. 
we those funds will also be used to promote the activities that we already have going on and to give you guys more content and there will be more exclusive access to things like our African social activism playbook, the actual one that we're going to do, the printed one, the, the downloadable PDF, you will get updated versions of it if you are a member and you will also get just the version that is unabridged. You get the full breadth of when we're talking about nation building. You'll get the economic strategies. Um, you know, the abridged version will probably have some community strategies and some other things and maybe a few offensive and defensive plays. But the membership copy will have the full breadth of the social activism playbook. So and if you want to find African Unity Initiative on social media and get in touch with us that way, we are at African Unity on all platforms try to make it as simple as possible okay and, you know we love you guys african with a k. <laughs> thank you for tuning in african with a k all day we love you guys thank you for tuning in we'll catch you tomorrow peace, peace.